Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again at Nutmeg Post with our engineer, Frank Ferderosa. Our guest this week is a singer, comedian, writer, and actor, an Emmy-winning game show host who's been working in the business for an impressive seven decades. He starred on the Broadway stage and in movies and appeared on dozens of TV shows, including The Ed Sullivan Show, Rowan and Martin's Laughing, 77 Sunset Strip, Love American Style, The Love Boat, Lou Grant, WKRP in Cincinnati, In Living Color, Mad TV, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch, to name a few. In his long career, he's worked with everyone from Bob Hope to Dean Martin to Buddy Hackett to Lucille Ball to Groucho Marx to Vincent Price. For nearly two decades, he hosted one of the most popular and highly rated game shows in television history, Hollywood Squares for which he took home five Emmys. But perhaps most importantly, he once guest starred on a show we've been obsessing about on this podcast, Lanigan's Rabbi. (laughs) Please welcome the versatile and multi-talented Peter Marshall. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I should be. I should have a bigger house after all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do. I do that. I did well, didn't I? Oh, it's yes. an impressive resume. Now Peter. we uh, we met once. We did something. Uh, there yeah. was a bunch. Of, there was Gene Rayburn and uh, I think uh, Bob Eubanks and Wink Martindale and and uh, a bunch of us. We you were doing some kind of a show and we went over and did something with you. And I, it's you know. I it's, wonder if that was up all night. It, it could very well be. I, it's 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 quite a it's quite a long time ago, and uh, you know it. Uh, you know I'm 90 years old, so what do you want from me? I don't worry. I, <laughs> I have trouble with yesterday. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday. We saw pictures of your birthday on Facebook. It was really lovely. They at the Paley Center here. They had a little do for me, and about 260 uh, lovely friends showed up, and we had uh, they they showed film of me from. Uh, from 1940, what was it, 1949, I had a show on ABC called, uh, what the heck was it called? Anyway, they, they, it was the first show ever uh, filmed back, uh, they sent back to New York, and I had never seen it. Uh, and uh, they, we did 11 of them, and we had the Neil Hefty Orchestra, a big orchestra. Oh, and Neil Hefty, wow. Yeah, and it starred Tommy Noonan and Pete Marshall. And uh, we were working in a little place here called the Bandbox, and we were getting 250 a week. And they asked us to do this show. And we were the stars, and we got $45 a week. Now, this is 49 But I thought they were all gone. They found three of the shows at the Television Academy. They showed that. And then I had never seen I had done Gordon Jenkins' uh, Manhattan Tower in 1954, uh, which was an hour and a half live. And uh, I had never seen that. And there it was. Uh, stuff I had, uh, me singing with Dinah, me singing with Dionne Warwick, me singing with all these different people, Bob, you know. It was just an amazing evening. This guy knocked himself, his name is Jimmy Pearson. He does all my stuff for PBS. I don't know if you have watched my big band stuff on PBS. But he puts all that stuff together. And he's just an amazing guy. So it was a thrill for me. Uh, and a lot of people showed up and a lot of dear, dear friends. And it was, it was a lovely birthday. Who were some of the people who showed up? Let me see. We had Bobby Morris, and uh, we had Barbara Eden, and we had Lonnie Anderson, and we had uh, Joanne Worley uh, was there. I saw Joanne her on Facebook. Worley and yeah. Artie Johnson, and yeah, uh, yeah you know uh, Alex Trebek, and uh, just people, you know, people I've worked with and I've known all my life. And Neil Hefty, that's he was the... my roommate at one time at the really? old Forest wow. Hotel. Odd couple I was, theme. I was and, fifteen. And was... Batman. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. He, yeah, you know, we were. He was uh, then. We were living at the Forest Hotel, and he was playing trumpet with Muggsy Spanier, I think, at the old Arcadia Ballroom. And I was, uh, uh, I was a page at the time. I had been a, uh, at fourteen. I was an usher at the Paramount Theater, 
And at 15, I was a page boy uh, at NBC. I was the youngest page. It was, it's a long story. I won't bore you how a little nepotism got me the job. But I was living with uh, with Neil. He would write arrangements for the Jerry Wald Band or Sonny Dunham and play, uh, for 10 bucks. And uh, I was dating Blossom Deary. Do you ever hear oh, of Blossom sure. Deary? Yeah, sure. A yeah, great piano sure, singer. Cabaret yeah. performer. We were all kids together. And uh, so when I got this TV thing, they were looking for a band. I said, I got the guy. And and that was Neil's first big band thing he ever did. That was 1949, yeah. He's well, come they, up on this show. Yeah. I'm we, sorry? I said his name has come up on this show. We he, mentioned oh, he, sure we talked has. about Neil He Hefty. also did the music for uh, How to Murder Your Wife with Jack and Lemmon. He did, he, and The Odd Couple. Yeah. And they did, did a lot of TV. And, and also Batman. Bump, 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 bump. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. He, he said he made more money from that than anything he ever did. Yeah. And now I became a regular on Hollywood Squares, uh, but this was later on with Whoopi Goldberg and Henry right. Winkler. Right. And now we had fun on Hollywood Squares, but I heard that your uh, period of Hollywood Squares, there was like kind of fun in a bottle. Oh, we uh, had... <laughs> wait, you must remember, it was very familial. Uh Charlie Weaver, Cliff Arquette, I've known since I'm 18. Wally Cox, I went to PS 165 at 109th Street. He was a year ahead of me. I've known Rosemary all my life. Vinnie Price, I've known since I'm 18. Uh, I mean, so we were all kind of family, and it was fun. And I was uh, I was imbibing a tad in those days. I haven't had a, <laughs> I haven't had a drink in about 45 years. But uh, I wouldn't drink on the show. But we would do three shows, and we'd have a big sumptuous dinner, and, and there was wine. <laughs> and Paul Lind and uh, whomever. Uh, and uh, th- so the Thursdays and Friday shows were quite wonderful. Uh, <laughs> you know, we never we never rehearsed. I, I, I just would walk in. Who's on the show? And it was amazing. So there would be Ginger Rogers or Gloria Swanson or something. You know, uh, Walter Matha. I would be so excited. And uh, and just we would just wing the whole thing. It was just a and it was a very loving bunch of people, the production staff, and we were on for sixteen years, and it was a love fest. It was really a lot of fun. Why were the Thursday and Friday shows in particular the uh, well? The, the there was wine at dinner. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> I so, to point that out. So by by the Thursday and Friday show, they were blasted. That, that, well, uh, some of us were. <laughs> not, not me. No, I never drank on the show. Yeah, I had too many words. So uh, no, I, I was a good boy on the show, but I would I would see some people just. You were talking about Glenn Ford a little earlier. Yeah, he had Thursday and Friday we'd have to carry him in, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and put him on his chair, and, and then go from there. But you know, he loved doing the show. He was a very sweet man, and uh, but he he had somebody with him at all times to drive him here and to there and back and. Uh, it was amazing. You know, I walked in one night and George Saunders was on the show. Wow. Now, I was, I said, George Saunders was on the show. I was so excited. Uh, anyway, it, it was a wonderful experience for me because it took me four and a half hours a week to do the show. So I got to work Vegas or we'd get 10 weeks ahead and I would go out and do the music man or, uh, you know, guys and dolls or whatever. So it was a, it was a blessed job and they paid me wonderfully, I must say. Now, I heard Paul Lynn, when he got blasted, uh, he was more than a handful. He could be grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good he, stories in your book about him, Peter. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, the book, they said, why don't you do a, your life story? I said, my life story. Nobody remembers the people. I, I you know, like Neil Hefty. Nobody remembers Neil. I said, <laughs> Nobody will remember anybody. And, and, and you, know, you talk about Jolson, who got me my first job. No, but the kids don't remember Al Jolson. Al uh, Jolson got you your first job? He did. He got me my, I was 14. Uh, my sister was in a show called Hold On To Your Hats. My sister was the actress Joanne Drew. Joanne Drew from Red River Red, and, uh, Red and, River and, and all, the all the Kings Men. Yeah, and she wore a yellow ribbon. Sure. And uh, her name was, was Joanna Letitia Lecoq. I'm Ralph Pierre Lecoq. I think our parents wanted us to know how to get along with people, so they gave us these names. So we, 
<laughs> to show us that life was not easy. You so know? that was a difficult upbringing with those names. <laughs> but when she, when she went to New York, my, our dad had died when she was 14 and I was 10. We li- were from West Virginia. Mom took her to New York, and she became uh, – John Robert Powers, the model guy, he gave her the name Joanne, uh, Joanne Marshall. And so when I got my first – I was Pete Marshall. I, w- I wanted to use my mother's maiden name. But they laughed. They said, well, that would be simple. I would have been Peter Frampton. Wow. So, oh, yeah. That's wow. funny. Isn't that's that strange? Funny. But anyway, he was in love with my sister. And uh, he would come. We were living on 93rd Street, West End Avenue. And he would come up there. My mother couldn't stand him. And uh, he was, my, my, my sister was probably 18 to 19 at the time. And there was this old guy. And uh, so he had schmoozed mother. And I was sitting there one day. And I was an usher at the old Riviera Theater. I don't know if it's still there at 96th Street and Broadway. And uh, he said, hey, hey, Katie, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an usher at the Paramount Theater. He said, no kidding. He said, give me the phone. He said, he, he dials it. Hello, give me Bobby Whiteman. Bobby, give me Bobby Shapiro. Hello, Bobby. <laughs> Joel here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got a favor. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You got it. Yeah, yeah. You start Friday. And that's how I got my first job around the business. I was <laughs> 14. I was 6'3 and weighed about 104 pounds. And uh, I was there for almost, oh, gosh, uh, until I got the gig at the NBC. Until I got the page board job. Yeah. And but, one, uh, oh, hey, go ahead. One question sure. I'm supposed to ask you that I told a couple of times on this show, but I think you were there. Might have and, been. And that's when you and Paul Lynn went into the Gold Diggers. Uh, they were those famous sexy girl dancers. Oh, from the D. Martin room. show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Okay, no. <laughs> the uh, story's been told on the show several times. Okay. Okay. But we were About told that you, well, yeah, you, we were yeah, told yeah. you had the definitive version. Yes. No, actually, I was not there. Uh, Wally Cox was there. Okay. Uh, Wally tells the story. Okay. Because oh, the way I heard it was that uh, Paul Lynn was brought into the Gold Diggers dressing room. That was right. these sexy girls that would dance in the Dean Martin show. And Paul Lynn looked around disgustedly and said, this place smells like cunt. No, I he think. didn't say that. <laughs> he said pussy. <laughs> <laughs> See, you've been corrected. <laughs> he said, this place moment. smells like pussy, and then there was a pause, and then he said, I think. <laughs> but what made me laugh was the I think. <laughs> now the truth could be told. The truth could be told, yeah. Well, go, go, that's, a, that's great. We finally got it so cleared up. It's, it's an educational program. Uh, yeah, you can, can say anything that. you want here, Peter. It's just on I the can, internet. I can see that. But tell yeah. us about Jolson. You were starting to tell us about Jolson giving well, you a, he, a, he got me that job. He, you know, and uh, actually, Joni was in love with the bass player. I think uh, his name was Artie Bernstein with the, with the Betty Goodman band. <laughs> but can you imagine? You can you remember? When I went to New York, it was 1938. There was bands everywhere. I mean, you know, at the New York, there was Glenn Miller, the Astor Roof would be the Harry James. You got the Strand, the Capitol, uh, Louis State. Then they had the Roseland Ballroom. You got, uh, I mean, it, it, and music. It was Rogers and Hart. It was Gershwin. It was cool. The first show I ever saw, I told this at my birthday party, was a thing called Leave It to Me with Gaxton and Moore. Now, nobody remembers William Gaxton and Victor Moore, but Victor Moore was really a great comedy actor. And uh, there was a little girl in the show who did a striptease. Now, I'm 12 years old. And she went down to Broad Patties, and Cole Porter wrote this song called My Heart Belongs to Daddy. That was Mary Martin. Wow. That's the first, that was my first show. Then I saw Buddy Epson and his sister uh, in, in, you know, in, in a show. And then I saw all, I, my sister took me to the Roxy Theater when I was 12. And I had no idea, but it, it was the most glorious theater I think I'd ever seen. And 12 years later, I'm headlining it. Can you believe that, you know? Uh, little did I know. But New York was just the most wonderful place because, first of all, it was run by the mob. And so it was clean and nobody <laughs> bothered you. Uh, it was safe. <laughs> you, your sister, yeah. Joe Andrew, married the singer, Dick uh, Dick, Dick Ames. Ames, right. And, and he, that helped you uh, get a leg up in the business. Do I have that I, right? Well, yeah, I always wanted to be a singer. And he was, he was um, I had lost, as I mentioned, I had lost my dad. So he was sort of my, my big brother or father figure. And he was just the greatest singer you ever heard in your life. And they met at the Paramount when she was one of the Copa uh, dancers, and he was singing with the Harry James Band. I think he was making $50 a week, and Joni was making 75 And he's about 
oh, about eight months after they got married, he teamed up with a guy by the name of uh, Billy Burton, a manager. And uh, within about three months, he was making 25000 a week. I mean, he had hit record after hit record. Nobody realizes that he was bigger than Frank Sinatra at one time. He was the highest paid American for two years in a row. Dick Ames. And, yeah. Wow. And uh, he, who was some of the big gangsters back then? Well, there's, I worked for Frank Costello at the Old Martinique in 1950. And I worked in Chicago. I worked for Dingy and Donjo at the Chez Paris. And I worked uh, for the Fatita Brothers down in Galveston. And every town had this. Yeah, and, and, and Fatita Mo Brothers. Davis, uh, <laughs> and I love I've it. I've heard uh, yeah, that right. from every performer says they loved working with the mob. Well, I, I, Mo Dalitz was like a surrogate father. And uh, Monty Prozer, who opened it, was Monty Prozer's Copacabana. It wasn't Jack and Trotter's. Jack, when Monty had it, Jack and Trotter was the doorman, okay? It was, and, and Monty Prozer, I met when I was 14 because my sister was a dancer, one of the Copa, Copa darlings. And uh, I worked for Mo Dalitz. I, Noonan and Marshall, we opened the Desert Inn in 1950. And Mo was so wonderful to me. And I knew him into his 90s. Uh, and he was, in fact, they said, hey, one, of the, one of these days they're going to ask you a favor. I said, really? Do you think so? Anyway, I got this call. This is what I'm doing well. And it's from Mo. He said, hey, I got a favor to ask. I, oh, my God. What's he going to ask? He said, would you host the Joe DiMaggio golf tournament? <laughs> 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 that was the favor he asked. Oh, not boy. so bad. And not not Frank, so bad. Frank and I were talking about Years ago, like there was Rowan and Martin's laughing. Right. And uh, I, I hear you and their straight man, Dan Rowan, you didn't have a high opinion of him. Well, it, it's not that I didn't have a high opinion. It's not. Uh, let me give you, I'll tell you the story. Dan was selling used cars, and Dick was a bartender. They did not know each other, they were not friends. And they both wanted to be in show business, and they were both very close to Tommy Noonan. Tommy. Uh, you know, he passed at 48. He was just a brilliant comic. Your, uh, your ex, we should tell our listeners, your ex, your ex partner, yeah, your ex comedy partner. We were partner. Newton and Marshall. Newton at one and Marshall. time, we were, we were really the hot guys. In 1950 at the Martinique, we took over New York. We were really, and especially on the West Coast, we were huge. And But anyway, uh, uh, he had these two friends. I knew Dick. I didn't know Dan. And he, they, he, he said, let's put them together for an act. I said, why ruin their life? He said, hey, well, then he, they, they want to be in show business. So we wrote their act. We got him an agent. Uh, Joe Rollo was a guy who uh, it was a, a very big agent out here in California. We even got them their first job. We were working at a joint in, in, uh, in uh, Palm Springs called the Chi-Chi. And uh, Irwin Schumann owned it. And we booked ourselves in and then canceled. And we called Irwin and said, we got an act for you. <laughs> and that's how they started. And over the years, they did wonderfully well. And uh, when Tommy was dying, uh, he was at the motion picture home. Uh, he was out there for eight months. I said to Dan, uh, I said to Dan and Dick, I said, hey, go, go go out and visit Tommy. You know, tell him how to talk about his, his life. It was, it's going to be okay. And, and be encouraging. Dick would go out all the time and sent money and think Dan never once went out. And that's, I was, I, I, so I, he was off my list. I just thought he was terrible for that. And Dan was not the nicest guy in the world anyway. He alienated uh, everybody. He would have alienated St. Francis, you know, and the Pope, you know, I, gosh. Anyway, uh, I, no, I didn't like him. And, uh, and his children, uh, his, his son is a very big lawyer out here. And, uh, uh, they don't speak to me, of course, and I don't blame them because I've said nasty things about their father. But I think I'm in the right to do it. And and then uh, I uh, Frank was telling me that when he, uh, originally it was Dan Rowan that well, got you mean for Hollywood Squares? Yeah, yeah. I was doing a show in New York called Skyscraper. It was the only musical Julie Harris ever did. I was her leading man and Charles Nelson Reilly. And the music was written by Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Hughes and some wonderful songs. I'll only miss her when I think of her. Great song. And uh, it ran about a year. And it closed. Uh, they usually give you two weeks to notice. But another show called Bajour was coming in. So they, it's amazing how timing is so important. They gave. I, I got back to California a week earlier than I should have. And the day after I got home, I got a call from uh, uh, Bob Quigley. And he said, uh, we're doing a game show and we'd like to talk to you. In those days, I was doing the Kellogg's commercials. And they were kind of cute. I had like 30 of them running. And his wife remembered me from Noonan and Marshall. 
and they were looking for this straight. So I walked in, and I saw this pilot they had done a year earlier at CBS with Burt Parks. In fact, I said, uh, he's awfully good. Why aren't you using him? And they said, we're looking for a complete non-entity. I said, oh, really? I'd been in the business 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they had, they didn't have it. You know, California has no idea what New York is doing. Do you realize that? Yeah, but sure. But anyway, uh, I was going to go back and do breakfast at Tiffany's. Abe Burroughs asked me what I like to do. And oh, I said, with Mary Tyler love. Moore. Yeah. Right. And so I, I they offered me this game show. Well, they talked to me about it. And I, I said to my agent, I said, I want to go back to New York. I, I was in love with the dancer. And... Uh, I wanted to. I want to. I, yeah, I grew up in New York. I went. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to go back, and so I go back to New York, and they called me. My agent. They said they want you to do this show called Hollywood Squares for thirteen weeks. I said, tell them I'm not really interested. And they said, well, okay, but if you won't do it, uh, Dan Ruin's going to do it. I said, really? <laughs> I said to screw Dan Ruin. I did the thirteen weeks. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I was going to still go back because I didn't think the show would last past 13 weeks. And they picked this up. And then uh, Abe Burroughs called me and said, they want to go blonde on a show. I said, what do you mean? He said, they want Richard Chamberlain. Well, they never even opened in New York. They did previews, but they never opened the show. So you never know. You right. take, take right. a left, you take a right, you take a shot. And who knows what's going to happen? I don't know. Well, had Dan Rowan become the host of Hollywood Squares, perhaps Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In never, never comes to be. Well, I'll tell you what kind of a guy he was. It was before Laugh-In. He never, Dick never knew this, by the way. I said to Dick, I said, Dick, did you ever know that Dan was up for Hollywood? was square he said no i said well there you go never told him never told him yeah no. yeah no. and and yeah the uh and the breakfast at tiffany's turned out to be as you said also yeah they'd closed in previews yeah they closed in previews and i think so the biggest show of your career is because you wanted to screw over dan Rowe. And that's about right yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. That's why I got the big house here. <laughs> That's paid for. <laughs> was there a second uh, pilot, uh, Peter, of Hollywood Squares with uh, Sandy Barron? Uh, Sandy did a pilot. I don't know if he did a pilot. Uh, Sandy was a friend of mine, by the way. Yeah, funny he guy. A, yeah, he was a cute guy. I think he did a run-through. I think he did some run-throughs. I don't know if they shot. They may have shot a pilot. I don't know. But I don't think so. The only pilot I ever saw was Burt Parks. Yeah. And so, now... Ro- uh, Rosanna Arquette uh-huh. and uh, oh, oh, David, uh, David Arquette. David Arquette, sure. Their uh, grandfather was Cliff uh, Arquette. Yeah, Cliff yeah. Arquette, yeah. who yeah. was known on Hollywood Squares as Charlie, Charlie Weaver. Weaver. Charlie well, he was Weaver. known throughout his career as Charlie Weaver. I yeah. met him when I was eighteen. Uh, there was a radio show called The Auto Light Show, and uh, he would play Dick Hames' mother, and he would uh, he would do the radio show in drag. And uh, he was maybe <laughs> he was maybe one of the cutest devils you ever met. There was a I don't know if I put it in the book. I may have. He was uh, he was single for many many years, and there used to be <laughs> there used to be <clears throat> what do they call a key club? Oh yeah, yeah it's in go, the book yeah, that he would go to key parties. Book. I did put it in the book. He was a swinger. Okay. Yeah, he, they would go to all he would go, all these different housewives. They would all get together <laughs> and. Uh, and, and and you know the husband he would he would hire a hooker and take her to this thing, and uh, so it was supposed to be his wife. It was the wives of these guys. <laughs> and so he, they would throw the key in the pot, and then he said, "I I screwed about every cute girl in Redondo Beach or wherever the heck it was." But he would take a hooker as his wife. So <laughs> it's a page out of Joey Ross. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, was he, he was the cutest guy you ever wanted to meet, and he was a very funny man. I, I met all the Arquette kids. They did a, a thing over at the Wilshire Hotel, and they asked me to host it uh, uh, for, for Cliff, and I did it. And I, I met uh, Patricia and, and David and, and uh, Roseanne, who gave me the sweetest hug. And she was this, I'm telling you, I, I don't know her. I don't know any of the Arquette, but that's a sweet girl. You can tell. Yeah. And and it's so funny because Charlie Weaver, that character of Charlie Weaver, right. was like this sweet little bumpkin. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> <laughs> he was a, he was a devil baby of the world. Let me tell you. <laughs> you know, he, he had a he was a Civil War buff, and he had this uh, uh, 
I, I don't know what, what it was back in, in some place in the east in Pennsylvania. And they had all these memorabilia, and he would spend a lot of time back there. He was really into that, yeah. He was just a lovely man. There's I, a piece I, in your book, Peter, about him uh, leaving the radio show in drag and then hanging out on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, yeah, well, you got to remember, in the old radio, <laughs> you'd have to do the show twice. If it, was, if it were 8 o'clock in New York, that meant you did it, uh, you did it at 5 o'clock here. Uh-huh. And uh, for eight o'clock in New York, and then you'd have to repeat it at eight o'clock in California. So you did the show twice. They didn't record in those days, and so uh, so he had like three hours, and he used to drink, and he would go out in front of CBS in drag, and, <laughs> and, and try to pick up sailors, just being facetious, you know. And they would get these reports about this old lady on, and the cops would say, "It's Cliff, it's Cliff, leave him alone," you know. Uh, but he was a cute guy, let me tell you. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about Wally Cox, who you, you also knew as a I kid. I loved Wally Cox. Yeah. He, do you know how he got into show business? Well, that's in your book, That's so that's how I know it. Oh, well, tell, our, you know. tell our listeners. Well, his best friend, they grew up together, was uh, Marlon Brando. And the funny thing is, between the two of them, Marlon was, was a pipsqueak. Uh, you know, Wally was a he – wrote, drove, he, wrote, he was built like – you know, a middleweight fighter, by the way. And he was I had a motorcycle. <laughs> and he, he'd say, hey, Marlon, let's go look at the flowers. You know, it'd be that springtime. Marlon would go, I don't know. He got you. Get the fire. I got away. So he ran the show, believe it or not. And I first met them in New York when I was working with Tommy, uh, probably about 19, yeah, 1950, I guess. And uh, they were rooming together. And, and Marlon and uh, I were sort of dating the same girl. Uh, Shirley Ballard. And so they would come up to the apartment. That's when I first uh, met Marlon, but I knew, I knew, I knew Wally. And throughout, he was never in, wanted to be in show business. He was a jeweler, really. He could build, he, he could do anything. He was just so clever and he, he made jewelry. And how they became, they were in military school together. They grew up together in Omaha. And then, as I said, I knew him at PS 165 when he was probably about 14 or 13, maybe. Anyway, uh, he would tell these stories from the war, from the war. And this one story was about Dufo. He said, I got this guy Dufo. And he did this whole thing on Dufo. And he told these stories. And uh, they said, why don't you go to the village vanguard and, 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 and do a show? Well, they went down to the village for one night. And in the audience was Irving, uh, what was his name? Uh, Greenbaum and... Uh, can't think of the other guy. They were developing a show called Oh, Mr. Greenbaum Peepers. and Fritzel. Fritzel. Larry. Yeah. yeah, the, uh, yeah. Fritzel. Yeah. Greenbaum Jim and Fr- Fritzel. Jim Fritzel. And they were there that night, and they had been looking for Mr. Peepers. Right. And out he came. They said, that's the guy. And that was his first <laughs> job in the business. And that's how he got into show business. Because Incredible. Of and it's yeah. funny because there again, uh, Wally Cox on camera always looked like the ultimate nebbish oh he was and he, talk about a ladies man he <laughs> was really a ladies man and he i tell you yeah but and, and he was so sweet and he was so extremely bright he knew nothing about show business <laughs> everything about show business you'd always say gregory peck uh, that was gregory peck so one night we gave him a and so everybody knew when he said gregory peck it was wrong so one night we gave him where the answer was gregory peck and he said it was gregory peck and the contestant said no that's not right and, and it was it cost a guy and like 800 dollars or something he of course was the voice of underdog sure mr peepers and underdog there's something in your book too peter about how when they were kids together that that marlon would come over to play with wally and he wally was wasn't so into playing with Marlon uh, that he would. That's what you put in the book. That he would pretend he wasn't home. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. I, you know, I, I wrote the book what ten years ago, so I would have to, you know, look at my notes and things like that. But incidentally, it's a pretty good book. It sold out immediately. Yes, and then the, the and I'm going to take take a moment to plug it. It's called Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square. And you can't really find it. I guess you can find it on Amazon. You found it on Amazon. I got it on Amazon, but we're going to plug the Kindle version. Yeah, the Kindle. I get checks every few months from Kindle. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a fun read it's, full of stories and great pictures. It, aren't they wonderful pictures? Yeah. It, it, you know, it got reviews like the best, the most definitive uh, game show book ever written. It got wonderful reviews. 
I wrote it with Adrian Armstrong, whose husband was Bill Armstrong, who was the uh, one of the original producers of Squares, who wrote all the great jokes. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, he drank a little too much and he passed early. But I miss him terribly. He, we became very close. And one person you talk about that his name has popped up before on the podcast, all with the same explanation, hysterically funny on stage, but... Everyone hated him in person. Who's and that? And that's Jackie Mason. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know Jackie Mason, yeah. uh, but I've, yeah, I, we had, you know, we did almost 6,000 shows in 16 years. And I think I asked the guys, please uh, don't invite him back. <laughs> uh, I think I did that twice. Out of all the hundreds of stars we ever had, I tell you why. Uh, he was very good on the show, by the way, but he brought the, the panel down. You know, one guy could bring the panel. You got nine stars, and if you talk over questions and if you, you know, interrupt people, it just disrupts the whole show. And that's unfortunately what happened with Jack. Uh, he, you know, you ever see him on Broadway? He's phenomenal. Very oh, terrific. Man. Very funny man. A very funny man. But for some reason, he just didn't work on squares. So Paul wasn't on the show for the first year. Uh, and then he, he was in different uh, cubicles, and then he became the star of the show. He got much more mail than I did. He got love letters and things, and, uh, you know, and I was pretty cute those days. But Paul got all, <laughs> you know, he, he, got, he got all the stuff, yeah. Now, I remember watching Hollywood Squares and seeing Groucho Marx. He he was on the show. I came in one night, and there was Groucho Marx, and it he did now work for him. Uh, I tell you how the show works. And Henny Young, I finally got Henny on the show, and I, we were shooting in Vegas. You know, I did the last year of Squares sure. in, at, the, yeah. at the Riviera, and uh, and and Goebel was my closest friend on the show. I've known George. We were in vaudeville. We we go back so many years when none of nobody knew who he was or who I was. And we loved each other. He was my neighbor. He lived around the corner. It took me two years to get him on the show. I finally got him on the show, and of course, he never left. And uh, so we had we roomed together uh, on the bottom floor at the Riviera, and uh, Henny had bad legs. I said, stay with us. Dress with us, because you do five shows. And I think he, actually, I think he was there for maybe 10 shows, whatever. <clears throat> and he came in. He said, how's your show work? I said, here's how the show works. I'll ask you a question. Uh, if you don't have a joke, just go to the – or if you have a joke, just like uh, the joke, how many men on a hockey team? About half, you know, whatever the joke is. And uh, just – it's, it's but up, but up. He said, I got it. So I said, Henny, in 1928, whatever the question was, four guys – he said, he sees, uh, t- t- these, two, these two guys went uh, uh, duck hunting and they came to us and – Duck here. They went home. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, he, <laughs> and, 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 and then I said, and, and I repeated, I said, 1920, and he went to another joke. Well, George fell off his chair. <laughs> I couldn't get him to answer the question. And I finally had to stop tape, which was very rare because he would have done a half hour, you know. <laughs> but he he's one of those guys that, man, he made me laugh. Henny Youngman, you know, I was, so, I was so lucky. I got to work with Harry Ritz, the funniest man I think I ever saw. Harry Ritz. Everybody copied Harry Ritz. Yeah, you and, say in the in the book that Jerry Lewis copied a lot from Harry yeah, Ritz. Everybody copied Harry Ritz. He was the funniest man around. But I got to work with Joe Frisco. You probably never heard of Joe Frisco. He was just one of the great comics. And and uh, I, but, yeah, I, anyway, I, my life has been, you know, I've worked with Durante. I've worked with Sinatra. I've worked... I've gotten to work with everybody that I know, and I'd love. I work with Jack Benny. We did a show in 1950 together. Uh, <laughs> you know, I toured with Bob Hope. Uh, it's I've had this blessed life, and it's uh, it's yeah. been. I got to sing with Bing Crosby. They showed all the stuff the other night of me singing with Dinah Shore, with with Dionne War, with Crosby. You know, it, they found all this wonderful old tape. I've been in show business 75 years, yeah. 90 years old. Wow. And, not bad uh, for a kid from West Virginia. Not a poor, bad a poor kid. kid from West Virginia. A poor kid from West Virginia. Yeah. You got and, it, yeah. But did Groucho work out on Hollywood Squares? Did his comedy... No, it didn't work for him at all. And after the show, I was so excited. I said, uh, I said, Mr. Marks, I, I can't tell you what a pleasure it was. I said, I hope we work together 
I, I hope you enjoyed yourself, and I hope you come back. He said, kid, the next time we'll ever get together, we'll, we'll have to be socially. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he didn't enjoy himself. He did not enjoy himself. But at least he sat there for five shows. Uh, a lot of guys didn't work on the show. Great comics. Uh, you know, Hackett was good on the show, but Hackett was better than the show. You know, Shecky, who is like, you know, family to me. We, we You know, we were kids together He's from Chicago. His first job was... I was uh, at the Chase Hotel in uh, St. Louis with this headlining, and there was a little room called the uh, Zodiac Room. As for time I met him, he did three one-hour shows a night for uh, by two fifty a week, and that's when I f- fell in love with that that crazy person. But he didn't really work as well. But I think uh, I think after a while, Shecky would have worked on the show, but he, he he was not happy. So, but it's 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 the show where you get a question and you got. That's why Paul. You know, why do motorcyclists wear leather? Because chiffon wrinkles. I mean, that's <laughs> that's that's the show. It's Let's get back be to, to up and up. Go go back to your friend George Goebel for a second, because there's good oh. stuff about him in the book. And 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 I didn't know this. There actually was a spooky old Alice. Yeah, oh, she was. Uh, I was out doing a, after squares. I did another show called Fantasy with Leslie Elgums. Then I went back to Broadway. I did La Caja Fall for three years. I did the National Company. Then I did the palace for a year, and then I did the Neil Simon's rumors. And I'm at I'm uh, where am I? I'm Kansas State, and uh, it was a one nighter, and we're there, and it's sold out. And I get a call from Alice that George had passed, and the he they wanted me to be the uh, what they ever called the the lead whatever. And I said, you know something, I cannot do this to the promoter. I cannot walk out of the of a full house. I said, and the one guy that would know that is George, because he wouldn't have done it either. And uh, so I never even got to go to his, to his funeral. But I loved him. He was like, oh, what a wonderful man. It's He was so funny. He was just so original. Uh, Noonan and Marshall, we were regulars on his uh, his variety show. He was a funny man. George Goebel. There's that man. wonderful clip of him on the uh, on the Carson show. You know the clip I'm talking oh, about? Sure. Yeah. With shoes. Dino yeah. and Bob Hope? Yeah. When yeah, they the put shoes. out the cigarette in his drink. Yeah, and he says, he makes the joke about the, the, the socks. Uh, Re- really funny, man. And he was original, by the way. He didn't copy anybody. And nobody was like him before or after. Did you say you interviewed Dick Van Dyke? We did. We had him a couple of weeks ago. Wasn't he cute? Great. I mean, oh. he, he, we're the same age. He's a little, he, I, I think he turned 90 about two months before. He also has a young wife. I have a young, beautiful wife I met uh, 30 years ago when I was 60, and she was 25. That, that's embarrassing. I have always hated old guys with young girls, and here I am. And, uh, <laughs> Good work if you can get it, buddy. Uh, but uh, I think Dick, when, when – uh, his last wife passed. I think he, he kept saying, you know, Pete may have a good idea here. And he married this lovely girl who uh, I don't really know her. very. I've met her, but Arlene. Uh, and it, yeah. we, we have so many similarities. Yeah, we're not we're not close friends or anything. We know each other. But uh, during the war, I was in Italy uh, during the war. and I was a disc jockey. And during the war, he was a disc jockey. And after the war, I was with Noonan and Marshall. And after the war, he did an act with three guys. And uh and then he did Bye Bye Birdie in New York with Cheetah Rivera. And I did Bye Bye Birdie in London with Cheetah Rivera. And then he got a hit TV series. I had a hit TV series. Then he did all these wonderful big movies. And I did all these terrible movies. Uh, but we, uh, I, I'm doing the Frank Sinatra one year. And we used to do an after show, a bunch of us. And I, and uh, Frankie Randall, who passed this past year, broke my heart. He was, I, he was my closest friend. And he was playing the piano. And I said, you know, there's a guy in the audience. We, our, we, similar we're not that close but we're similar and i'd love to do by uh, put on a happy face with him he got up i would love to have a film of van dyke and myself doing put on a happy face oh gosh yeah I, that'd be a gift I, on the podcast i got dick to sing put on a happy face with me and a duet uh, there you go <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i i as i said i'm a huge fan he is just uh, so delightful and so talented, and I don't think he has a clue how good he is. I really have no idea. Interesting. I, I don't think he does really not know how wonderful he is, but he's and, wonderful. And you worked with Phil Silvers. I did. I worked with uh, – I, I, Phil Silvers, to me, was the greatest straight man that ever lived. We talk about George Burns, who was quite wonderful. And Jack Benny actually was a straight man. He was straight to all those great comics. Uh, but the greatest straight man I ever saw work uh, 
you got to remember that's how he started in in, in uh, at burlesque. He was a straight man with uh, uh, Rags Raglan. And uh, if you ever saw Phil Silvers and Rags Raglan, there's some film on them, by the way, doing uh, Who's on First long before really long before Abbott and Costello. Interesting. Wow. Oh, Who's on First is no burlesque bit. Yeah, yeah. And the the first film ever done on Who was uh, Who's on First is is uh, Phil and Rags. And it's out there somewhere. And uh, it's just, you know, uh, one night we're at the Lower Tarleton Hotel in Florida. We're working somewhere. Uh, and Tommy used to drink a lot. And I wouldn't drink too much. I never drank too much. And Phil is doing, he's on, and it's a benefit, and he's hosting it. And he's brilliant. And Tommy keeps interrupting him. And uh, so he got Tommy up with him. And Tommy didn't say a word. And Tommy's never been funnier. And that's what I said to myself. I'm maybe I'm not that good, you know, <laughs> because it was, it was all Phil Silvers. What he did with Tommy was brilliant. It, you know, he was great. And, uh, you know, he was a gambler. He, you know, he'd worked Vegas and all the money he made on television with Nat Heiken, you know, at the show, the Bill, the Bill Coe show. He blew in Vegas and Reno and wherever. And, uh, oh my God. But, I loved him very much. Uh, I, you know, I, as I said, that was a great era there, and everybody was sort of available. And I got to work with a lot of wonderful people in my life. And tell us about knowing Uncle Milty. You've known him since he was since you were kids. <laughs> when I was a page boy, I first met him. His uh, wife was in Hold Out Your Hats with my sister and Al Jolson and Martha Ray and Jinx Falkenberg. I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. She divorced Milton and then married uh, Billy Rose. And then divorced Billy Rose and remarried Milton. So I've known Milton since I'm maybe 14, 15 years old. And he was always very, very kind to me. I used to do a show at the old Vanderbilt Theater. I paged uh, the Fred Waring show. And it was like on a Thursday night. And uh, they would do the broadcast and they'd do it. And then he and uh, I just had her name as first. He and, he and his wife would pick me up and take me out to dinner. And uh, Milton was wonderful to me all my life. I've known him all my life. And he did squares. Yeah, he did a lot, in fact. In your book, he complained. It says, you said he oh, complained about his dressing Oh, that's one of my favorite room. stories. Yeah. It was, like the second, it was like the second week of the show. <laughs> and uh, they came to me and said, Milton Berle is very unhappy. I said, why? They said, he doesn't like his dressing room and he's going to leave. What are we going to do? I said, I'll handle it. So I go back and I said, Milton, now we did five shows, so he's got five jackets hung up. I said, Milton, go home. This is a <laughs> dumb game show. You're Milton Berle. There's no way you should be doing this show. Go home. Don't worry about it. Uh, I can call Toluca Lake. I can get uh, Joanne Worley. I can get uh, Abby Dalton. Uh, Milton, go home. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I know you're unhappy with your dressing room. He said, I built a studio. You know, This is a lousy dressing room. I said, Ed, I said you're absolutely right. And Milton, go home. He said, I'm not going to go home. I got these five jackets and I've never quit a job in my life. I said, I'm doing the show. I said, okay. So I walk in. They said, what is, what's going on? I said, let's not talk about it. It's going to be okay. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and, and now I can't let Milton Berle's name be mentioned. Uh-oh, Peter. On the show Why? without talk about his famous apparatus. Uh, yes, he, uh, I never saw it. <laughs> I, I, I will give you some trivia about Milton. I bet you don't know. Uh, very few people know this. He had 11 toes. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. So, so it made a bit of an addendum. I have no idea. An extra foot, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so so there were several physical yes. abnormalities. Yeah, he and Milton. Forrest Tucker and a couple of other guys were very famous for their apparatus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew him well, but not that well. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for not dodging I, the question, I, Peter. I heard Forrest Tucker once hit a golf ball. No, I mean, he no, had to no, get on his I knees. Don't, no, I, that, that can't be. No, no. I played golf a lot with Forrest Tucker on the Calabasas. You know, I used to play, this is true, I'd play with Forrest Tucker and uh, Mickey Rooney, two of the craziest people I ever knew in my whole life. Oh, gosh. Uh, as long as we're talking about the old days, let's talk a little bit about Noonan and Marshall. And Gilbert was talking about your movie, The Rookie. You know, they just showed it the other day. Somebody, I got a couple of calls. We did a movie. It cost $158,000 uh, to do this movie. Uh, 
uh, Fox was dead. Fox was dying. Uh, they Cleopatra. It, there were uh, there was a, a show about a guy on a boat. I can't think of that show. And it was one. I think Jerry Wald had a, an office over there. Anyway, they said they would do this movie, and to, uh, Tommy. Uh, George O'Hanlon wrote it. Remember George O'Hanlon? He was uh, the voice of yeah, Mr. George Jetson. Jetson. George Jetson. Yeah. That's right. And he was also the guy behind the eight ball, the old shorts. Remember that? Uh, oh, you two, you guys are too young. Uh, in movies, they would have shorts after the movie, and they, you'd they had like a a, a, a ten minute little. What these short. like the Pete Smith? Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. And it was called the man behind the eight ball. He, yeah. he, he, it was, was he's always falling off a roof or something. Oh, anyway, yeah. uh, George wrote this thing. And Tommy and he sold it to Fox. Uh, and we did this movie in about, I don't know, three weeks, whatever it was. And uh, there was nobody there. It was just uh, uh, Julie Newmar was in it. She was long before she was famous. And we did this uh, this dumb movie. And it it was a smash hit. You know, they, they for years they would have a, a cult in New York where they would show the movie once a year and people would come to see this movie. I just saw it recently. Uh, it was okay. Uh, the, the scenes I like, we played two Japanese guys in a two-man sub that capture ourselves. That was kind of fun. But uh, <laughs> the, this movie, uh, the head of the studio called because we did a movie after that was awful that didn't do very well at all. He said, you know, your little movie – kept the studio open for a year. He said, thank God for your movie because uh, that's how the studio stayed open. Yeah, The Rookie did very well. It was a big, big hit. With Joe Besser. Joe Besser. I love Joe Besser. You know, I can tell you stories about Joe Besser. Uh, You know that Luke Costello copied Joe Besser. Yeah, it was just I, uh, we we read an interview with the Cliff Nestor off, and uh, it was very interesting that you said where that. He put Cliff Besser, uh, where he put uh, Joe Besser on a contract. Yeah. He wouldn't let him work. He had, he paid him so he wouldn't work. Costello, yeah. Oh, just so he could hide the fact he, he, that Joe Besser was uh, was much funnier than Luke Costello. <laughs> wow, interesting. Yeah. And and then your second movie was du- Double Trouble, which was uh, originally written for Martin and Lewis. I think so, and it wasn't very good. Uh, I didn't see it because after the movie finished, I was offered this job in London, and I said, Tommy, you know, I don't want to do the act anymore, and. Uh, we had broken up once before and it became Marshall and Farrell for about four years. Uh, we were signed to do Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. He opposite Marilyn Monroe and me opposite Jane Russell. And Daryl Zanuck was in New York and saw uh, a guy, what the heck was his name? Uh, I can't think of it. Anyway, he signed him to do the, so they paid me off and Tommy played opposite. That's If you go see Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, that's my partner, Tommy Noonan, playing Gus opposite Marilyn Monroe. And he got hot after that. And he really couldn't do the act. So we broke up, and I teamed up with Tommy Farrell. And then I got back with Tommy uh, when they opened the Tropicana. We went in there for almost a year at a book show uh, called Monty Prozer Loved Us. And then we did the movies, and I was offered Bye Bye Birdie in London. I said, Tommy, I'd love to do this. He said, as your partner, it's going to screw me up, and as your friend, you're nuts if you don't. And we, we we never had an argument. We were, but that's what broke up Noonan and Marshall. I went to London and and then I went to Vegas with it. And you know, I was out on my own for the first time, and uh, it was quite wonderful. But uh, you know, Tommy died at 48. He was uh, he was a brilliant comic, and he would have, make a million dollars. You know, he'd produce. He did a thing called Promises, Promises, not the Broadway show, long before the Broadway show with with uh, Jane Mansfield. And it was just awful. But she's nude through the whole thing. And nobody had ever done that. And uh, and they, they couldn't get a release on it. And anyway, his wife called me, Pokey called me one night. I said, they got these pictures in Playboy magazine of Tommy and, and Jay Mansfield nude all over the place. I said, honey, go to bed. You're going to get a release. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Tom made a fortune. Then he went to, to, to Europe and bought all these terrible movies. He went broke again. Then he did another movie at... And when he got sick, he wasn't doing well. But uh, he was the one, one. I called him the Irish Mike Todd. Up and down, up and down. But he was fun. Did you guys do a pilot for Jackie Gleason? Uh, I did. Uh, Marshall did. and Farrell. Marshall yeah. and Farrell without Tommy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marshall and Farrell. That was Cafe Mardi Gras. You could buy it, by the way. Uh, they showed it the other night at my birthday party. They showed a portion of it. What is it called? 
It's called uh, Cafe Mardi Gras. Wow. Uh, he loved the way I sang. I used to work the Billy Grace Bad Box with Tommy, and he always come in. He was doing The Life of Riley. People don't remember Jackie Gleason doing The oh, Life of yeah. Riley. Oh, yeah, sure. But he did it, yeah. Skinnier and Jackie then, Gleason. And when I'd work in New York, he'd always be there. He said, Pally, I'm going to do a pilot. Pally, and Tommy would get excited. Tommy Farrell. I said, he, he's drunk. Don't worry about it. He came in, he said, we're doing a pilot. They shot one of the most expensive pilots ever done at that color studio up on Broadway. Uh, it, I had the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. Paul Whiteman. I had as guests Sammy Davis, uh, Hildegard. I had all the dancers. I had the Seven Ashton. And we did this wonderful pilot that they showed at Toot Shores on a big screen. It was glorious. And he gave me, he said, can't, can't, go buy yourself a Jaguar. I said, could you let me four bucks to get to the east side, you know? <laughs> and uh, the next day, I'm wandering around MCA or William Morris, and they're all looking at it on a small screen. And it looked like an old MGM movie. And I said, this will never sell because it's too big. It was huge. We had 28 dancers. We had, and was, that's when the, the screen was small, you know. So it never sold, but it was a good pilot. And, uh, I think uh, it's it's called Cafe Mardi Gras. Cafe Mardi Gras. We'll I think look you for that. We, yeah. we will we'll definitely look for it. I read an odd story of some hotel you worked at where the owner of the hotel did jail time for I think you Long. Uh, yes, uh, I, I I could talk about it. I'm not going to mention names. Uh, only because it's a long time ago, but uh, there, I'm sure there's some offshoots. Uh, <laughs> a, a guy I knew very well, uh, only after he got out of jail, went to jail for nine years. And when he, when he got out of jail, they gave him the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans. And uh, that was his hotel, Lock, Stock and Barrel. And he was just one of the most genteel, nice men I ever knew. And we used to work it all the time. Yeah, I worked the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans. You, you was, mean he was t- instructed to take the fall for Huey Long? And, I don't and, know if he, I don't know how it worked out, but he I took see. the fall for Huey Long. Yeah, wow. sure, nine years, yeah. But he did the jail time for uh, Huey uh, Long. Nine years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But he had a beautiful hotel when he came out. <laughs> <laughs> What do you remember about your uh, your Dean Martin roast, Peter? Uh, <laughs> I was yeah. looking at some of it today on YouTube, and it's, it's fascinating yeah. to see Foster Brooks and Orson Welles and yeah. Joey Bishop and and Vince, your friend Vincent Price, yeah, and everybody it, it, giving you the business. Uh, I was so busy in those days. I was working Vegas about twenty seven weeks a year. I was doing Hollywood Squares. I was doing specials, and I get a call. From Greg Garrison, who that was his show. He was the producer. He said, "Hey, Kitty, uh, he, I go back to the old Kate Smith show when he was directing that." He said, "Hey, uh, we want to roast you on the Dean Martin show." I said, "I, I, was, I don't have time." And he said, "It's thirty five thousand, and it takes you about two hours." I said, "I'll be there." <laughs> 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 and I had turned it down, but Greg, I went there and uh, I did the show. And it was and what's his name? The guy that used to write for Burrow. What the heck was his name? He wrote for years and years. It was just the worst material in the world. So I called a couple of guys and uh, they wrote me some nice jokes. You know, Zsa uh, Zsa's nice seeing. They said, "Have you sitting up?" You know, uh, her name is Rosemary. The reason being, her family didn't want her to have a last name. They, and, you know, some cute stuff. But I had a great joke. I said, "And uh, Orson, it's so good to see Orson again." I was stationed on him in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> They cut that joke. <laughs> but uh, these guys wrote me some real cute stuff, you know. And if I could do anything, I could do that kind of stuff. And it was wonderful. I got all these wonderful reactions, and, and I have it. I have it, which is so nice. I have a lot of old stuff, you know, uh, that they showed the other night. They showed a lot of stuff the other night, things I never saw. Yeah, it was really fun. It was, it was a wonderful ro- a, a wonderful party they threw me. And you were talking about Tony Randall. Tony Randall. You know what his real name was? Wow. Leonard Rosenberg. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's a, but there's a piece in your book about he, uh, him not being terribly cooperative on the squares. And you, you called him out on the air? I did. And he was very upset. And he said, you know, that was very unprofessional. And I said to him, 
I said, you know something, Tony? You're a pain in the ass, but you're dead right. That wasn't professional. And he was right. I should never have done it on the show. But he kept interrupting and kept <laughs> going. And I finally said, I said, Tony, if I got, you're a pain in the butt. And he was very taken back. But he came back. He kept doing the show. He was, and I liked him so much, you know. But uh, he could be a pain. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> but he, you know, he, he was very good to Klugman. I don't think Klugman had a piece of uh, Odd Couple. And when the show was over, I know that Tony gave him a piece, and uh, and Klugman didn't have to work for the rest of his life. I think he did, but he didn't have to. So That's nice. Tony Randall helped support Klugman. Yeah, he, he wow. was very nice to Klugman. Yeah, because it was his deal. Here, here's some more stuff about squares, Peter. That's the fun stuff in the book. I mean, you, can you tell us what the locks box was? The lock. Oh yeah, it was the square on the bottom, the three squares, the one in the middle, because it rarely got called upon. So if somebody was really dull, we would put them there. And, locks uh, L O X. That was the locks box. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And yeah. there's a story about Red Fox giving a hard time, like oh, kind of to harassing. Sandy Duncan. Yeah, she said, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm doing the show. <laughs> I'm doing the show, and <laughs> Sandy Duncan is going, oh. oh, 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 oh. I said, what the heck's going on? <laughs> well, he was saying to her, hey, he said, you ever seen a black one? I'm going to show you a black one right here. <laughs> <laughs> and he was doing all this terrible stuff to Sandy Duncan, you know? <laughs> and so after the show, she was crying. And they said, what are we going to do? And I said, don't worry about it. We put Tony Fields next to him. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she, we put her up where Tony was. Yeah. Oh God. Fun. You want to talk about fun? That was fun. And and another time a, a contestant showed up. I'm see if you remember this story. And Pat Buttram, who was one of the celebrities, recognized the contestant. Oh yeah, we couldn't use her, right? Because she was. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. A uh, courtesan. A, uh, yeah, a lady of the evening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> talk well, about Pat Buttram. Did. He he wrote jokes for everybody, you know, for nothing. He was one of the best joke writers that ever lived. Mr. Haney from Green yes. Acres. Yeah. Uh, the last thing he ever did was with, with me in Linton, Indiana, for Phil Silver, uh, Phil Harris. Phil Harris was a very close friend. I know Phil all my life because of my sister. And Ed, Ed, it's too long a story, but I've known him since I'm a, I'm a teenager. And he was I just loved him to death. And uh, I would go back to Linton with like Roy Clark and other people and do shows for his birthday. And we'd play golf or whatever. And the last time uh, he went back, uh, he, he went back with me. And uh, I the last time Pat ever worked was with me at Linton. It was Roy Clark, Pat Buttram, and myself. My goodness. And uh, he, he got sick. But he would write jokes for every. He was one of the great joke writers and one of the funniest men you ever want to know. Yeah. Uh, he was very close to Gary Owens. Uh, Gary's gone now. Gosh. Yeah, we, we, we were, wanted to have Gary on this show in the worst way. Yeah, he was terrific. And they, my neighbor lived right around the corner from me here. Now, what do you remember about Gary Owens, who for our audience – was the announcer of uh, Aladdin. Aladdin. And many other things. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Gary was one of the top radio guys. I'm on Music of Your Life. I've been doing Music of Your Life for over 20 years. You can catch me in New York. Uh, I I have two stations in New York. I used to have 208 AM stations. Now we're down to 36, but I'm like you guys. I'm on the internet. Just go to musicofyourlife.com. I'm on at 9 o'clock on the West Coast every day for two hours and at noon, I guess, in New York. And uh, I, I don't listen to the show. It's radio. And I tape it right around the corner. In fact, it's Tito Jackson's old studio. It's his mansion right here in Encino. I've been on. I've been doing. But Gary uh, was on Music of Your Life and Wake Martindale and all. And he was just a, and he taught me an awful lot about radio. And I, I play all big band music and all, all the great singers. My thing is all 40s, 50s music, you know. And I, I, know, this, I know everybody I talk about. I've worked with most of the people, and I tell stories and, and play this music. And it's been very successful, actually, for 20-some years. But Gary was one of the top radio guys uh, in the country, yeah. A versatile talent. And, and he did voice. Uh, he did cartoon voice service. He was the original he, ghost of, the voice of Space and, Ghost. Uh, and, uh, he and what's his name? Um, Stan, uh, well, not Stan. Stan, Stan Freeberg? Stan Fre 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 yeah, but the other guy, the little tiny guy. Uh, 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 well, anyway, they, they were big voiceover guys. Stan, yeah. Stan Irwin? 
No, no, no. Uh, uh, your audience wouldn't even know him. I guess uh, you guys wouldn't know. You know how I first met him? I was doing the Millionaire. Remember the Millionaire? Oh sure. yes, yes. Sure. He gave away a million dollars a year. I was getting, I think, seven hundred and fifty dollars working the whole week. And the first shot, we're all getting makeup. The first shot, this Rolls Royce picks up, this pulls up, and this little tiny guy, Paul Freeze. Paul Freeze. Oh, Paul great, Freeze. The most famous of all. Yeah, sure. And the busiest of all. Greatest Paul voice Freeze gets out of this Rolls. He's in a suit. They go, he sits in a chair. They make up his hand. They make up his hand. And he's got a script in front of him. Well, today's uh, recipient of the million. And he reads it, gives uh, Marvin Miller the envelope, and he gets in the Rolls and he leaves. He was paid like $2,500. I said, that's what I want to do. That's uh, but Paul he he was the millionaire but you never saw him all you saw was the hand the hand and the envelope oh uh, he did millions of oh, movies he, he, and Paul Fries yeah he Paul was so big cartoons. that he wouldn't go to a studio you would have to go he would li- finally lived up in uh, uh, San Francisco you would have to fly to his studio to record him <laughs> that's how big he was uh, the, you know Orson Welles didn't want to do the wine commercial so he did it and he sounded just like Orson Welles. Wow. So he looped Orson Welles. <laughs> he was he became on ra- on uh, radio. That's he, great. He, he was on radio. And, 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 so uh, he uh, something something before it's time. Remember oh, that? Oh, uh, Paul Masson. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. No, no so wine finally, before it's time. <laughs> <laughs> finally, it wound up that Orson, Orson Welles started doing it himself because he, he's out of all this money. But <laughs> Paul Fries could do anybody. He was brilliant. Yeah. Tell us about. I was telling Gilbert this from the book, and it's a fun, a fun uh, story. And I believe you have this framed in your house. Is a letter from from John Wayne? A threatening letter. He's going to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Yeah, I got this letter from John Wayne, and it goes on and on. And uh, the question was, according to Rona Barrett, what did John Wayne's children call him? And the answer was, Sir. Well, he took umbrage to that and wrote me this. He's going to beat me up. And uh, I have to do it on the air uh, to apologize. And if not, uh, and, and I've got the, it's one of my prized possessions. Yeah, <laughs> I have it in my house. I, and I have it framed with John's picture with, and, a, and guns all around it. Yeah. I, I don't have a recording, unfortunately. But I once did a joke about Marlon Brando on Hollywood Squares. And Whoopi Goldberg received an angry phone call from Harlan Brand. Oh, there you go. <laughs> People watch the show. Yes. <laughs> I, I also have to ask you about uh, uh, another another fun squares uh, question that's in the uh, that's in the book, Peter. Did you, Rosemary, Paul Lynn, Karen Valentine, and Annette Fabre all go to a topless bar? We did. Uh, what- <laughs> It wasn't a topless bar. It was a nude place. I mean, everybody was nude. nude nude. Excuse me. And it just opened in Van Nuys. And now we're we're doing squares. And I said, hey, this nude place has just opened. And let's all go. So it was Rosemary and Paul. And I was very close to Charles Nelson Riley. It was Charlie, uh, Nanette Fabre. Love her. uh, And all of us, we went. And, And they had not only nude. 18-year-old new dancers, uh, they had these graphic movies showing on the wall. <laughs> and after about eight minutes, I said, you know something, this is really, it was boring. So we left. About three minutes after we left, it was raided. Now, would nice. that have been wonderful to oh. have us all in jail? Paul oh, in, in jail for, for, in a nude, nude bar, and Rosemary, and, and Karen Valentine, and Nanette Fat. I was, oh, I laughed so hard. I said, that would have been so much fun. It was rated about three minutes after we left. Yeah. yeah. I love that one. One night. Yeah, we, we had a lot of fun on that show. <laughs> and then some. <laughs> now, I was surprised to hear that the great character actor, Sid Gould. Sid Gould? Did you yeah. love Sid Gould? I do. Do you know that he once did an act with Ralph Young? Remember Sandler and Young? Sure. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Went, Sid we Gould. saw that on Cliff Nesteroff's website. We still yeah. want to get uh, what's and, a, Tony Young on the show? Uh, no, to Ralph Young and Ralph Tony Young. Sandler. Tony Sandler. Tony still Sandler. With us. Ralph Young. Yeah, we want to get him on the show. Uh, no, I'm, uh, you can get Tony. Uh, Ralph's oh, yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> if you get Ralph, let me know. I'd love to see him again. <laughs> uh, he was my production singer at the. Uh, he, I used to play the Latin Quarter. Maybe for 15 years in New York. 
I had to play with Noonan and Marshall and Marshall and Farrell. We'd play it a couple of months a year. I have a. I don't know if it's in the book. Did I ever tell you the the Sophie Tucker story? Is that in oh, the no, book? Oh no, we were going to ask you about it. It's on my card. Oh, you it did is the a, Sullivan Show with Sophie Tucker, didn't you? Uh, no, I was working the Latin Quarter. Oh, the Latin Quarter. Yeah, and I was there three months. Whether it was said Sophie Tucker and Noonan and Marshall, or maybe could have been Marshall and whatever, Marshall Farrell. Anyway, in the three months, all she ever said to me was. Blah, blah, blah. That was about it. Uh, she was just mean, and uh, she was, <laughs> uh, I tell you. Well, what, I don't know what, she, what the, what, one of the dancers she did something. She he may have done a crossover in front of her, but she tried to get him fired. And Ed Rissian, who ran the Latin Quarter, wouldn't do it, of course. And But she had him, I don't know what happened, but he was very upset. This is a true story. He came in the next night with a Sophie Tucker doll. He made a, a, a voodoo doll. And in front of all of us, in front of all of us, this is true, he took a needle and he stuck it into her left hip. Now, not a week later, not three months, an hour later, she's coming down the steps at the Latin Quarter. She falls and breaks her left hip. And I go, Never screw with a dancer in the show. Wow. <laughs> Never cross a dancer. Never with the gypsies, leave them alone. That's a true story. I was there. I saw that. That's my Sophie Tucker story. Wow. And then she, she, she would go after the thing. She would sell books, you know, for charity. Of course, she kept all the money. Um, <laughs> oh, she was something. <laughs> There's so many people we could ask you about, Peter, as we, we wind this down, and there's so many questions, and we could talk to you for hours, and you're such a great sport. I don't know what to ask you about. Sammy, Jonathan Winters, uh, your Sammy, buddy. Vin- Sammy you- started, uh, his, that was our opening act, the Will Maston Trio. Paid him seven fifty a week. Newman Marshall's opening act, yeah. How about that, Gil? Yeah. Oh, and you know, what they used to get, you know what they used to give Sammy? Will, Will, they give him $8 a week. And his teeth were going bad. So I took him to my dentist, Dr. Gamble, and got his teeth fixed. Yeah, I go back a long time. You know, for when he became famous, it was a long time he didn't speak to me. And I couldn't figure out why. And now I'm in London. I'm, there's this wonderful private club that all the actors belong to. And I'm with Cheetah and a bunch of us. And I'm at the bar. And he comes over to me. He was living in London at the time. And he comes over to me. And he said, hey, man, I'm sorry. And I looked at him and I said, you little shit. You should be sorry, you know. I don't know why he didn't talk to me. I have no idea. Because I would never do anything. To, yeah, I loved him. He was uh, like family to me. I just loved him. And so, was, Sammy just, Davis, you Sam, helped out. Well, you fixed I, everybody, teeth. hey, there are many people that helped me out. In the old days, that's what we did. We each helped everybody. We wouldn't steal material. If we were in a club and, say, we are at Eddie's in Kansas City, and we say, we'd say to the Eddie brothers, hey, there's a great act, you know. Uh, we'd plug each other. We helped each other. It was a family affair in the old days, yeah. Not as crazy as it is today. I wouldn't want to be young and and uh, try to fight the battle today. And what was Vincent Price like? The best. I knew him since I was 18. As I said, I, I you know, I, Dick Ames was the number one guy over at Fox, and he was on the contract to Fox. And I first met Vincent when I was 18, and uh, he was he was another devil baby, and he was just we would we took cruises together, you know. He and Carol Carol Coral, his Coral Brown, who he married this wonderful English actress, and we took cruises together, and we yeah we were close. We were yeah. He was a, a wonderful st- man. There's a salacious story in your book, and I can I bring it up? <laughs> of course, with your ex-wife and you and and Coral Brown and Vinny. Uh, Vince, and Vincent Price said to you? Uh, oh, yes. We were on a cruise. And uh, uh, it, it was Coral, I think, that said to uh, Sally, she said, you know, you, Vinny, and myself would make a lovely trio. And Sally laughed a lot. <laughs> to, his, to his wife. <laughs> She came back. She said, I've just been. I've had a wonderful offer. <laughs> now, yeah. did you ever work with Jerry Lewis? I, I've opened for Jerry many times, yeah. When I put my act together in about 1977, I put an act with five kids very successfully. We we worked continually for about 11 years called the Chapter 5. Monica Mancini was my lead singer. I needed a break-in date, and uh, Joey Stabile, Dick Stabile's brother, was his manager. And uh, 
I needed to break a date because we had a date at the Flamingo. We went in for four weeks for Bill Miller, a wonderful man. And uh, Jerry heard about it. And he called and said, I'm at the, I'm here at this outdoor theater. I'll be here a week. I need an opening act. I've only got 9,000, but uh, you are welcome to come. And uh, we came in. It was what a great break because we broke in the act. We opened the Flamingo and got a five-year deal with Suma, you know, with Howard Hughes. Uh, Jerry, I opened for at the Sahara many times and other places. And uh, he was wonderful to me. You hear these stories. Uh, he was wonderful to my singers. I don't have a bad thing to say about Jerry Lewis. Wow. That's good to hear. And you made a movie with Art Carney and Lucy. I did. Yeah. It, 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 you could probably get that on. The, it was a television movie called uh, Happy Anniversary and Goodbye. Yeah. Right. And uh-huh. we, we, we talk about Art Carney on this show. He's a favorite of, of Gilbert's and mine. What can you tell us about him? Well, uh, I was offered the movie, and I turned it down. I had worked with Lucy on The Lucy Show. I played her brother-in-law uh, with uh, the great Janet, Janet Waldo, the great uh, radio actress, played my wife. And it was the time of the uh, Cuban crisis, and I have four kids. I'm just worried about where I'm going to hide them. And uh, they're worried about the show, and uh, Lucy wasn't very nice to me. In fact, she was awful to me. And... Um, well, I must say, after the show, she knocked on my door. She said, you were wonderful on this show. And they offered me 13 shows. Uh, and I turned it down. And I needed the job. I just didn't want to work with her. So many years later, I'm doing squares, and I'm kind of hot. And uh, they they called me and said, hey, they want you. For, uh, Lucy wants you for this movie called Happy Anniversary and Goodbye. And I said, no, I don't want to do this movie. I don't want to work with that woman. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> they called me back about, oh gosh, two days later, and uh, her husband at the time said, are you nuts? Every Everybody in this town, every young guy wants this part. I said, I don't want to work with your wife. And he said, you don't have any scenes with my wife. All your scenes are with Art Carney. I said, I'll do it for scale, you know? <laughs> and I had, I had met Art Carney, but I never worked with him. And... I, I got to work with Art Carney. Now, we're doing the read-through. You know, you do a read-through. I said, have you ever worked with Lucille Ball before? He said, no. He said, I'm really excited about it. I said, you'll quit. <laughs> he said, I, I'm not going to quit. <laughs> well, we're doing the read-through. She said, that's a terrible reading. He thought she was kidding. And she starts criticizing his read. <laughs> well, he quits. So he goes, I grab him. And I said, you can't do this to me. Art, the only reason I'm doing this damn thing is because of you. I, it's the only reason I'm doing it. Well, the next day, so we came back. The next day, Nanette Fabre, she quits. Now, Art and I are after <laughs> Nanette Fabre. <laughs> Actually, he became very close to Lucy. She she was strange. Uh, to work, I guess socially. I was never socially with her. Uh, they say she was lovely. Uh, but to work with her, she was a tough old broad. And, uh, but people adore her and she has such nice kids. I mean, Lucy, young Lucy is just wonderful. I don't know her son too well. Didn't she show up on the set of squares complaining? Uh, yes. She wanted, uh, uh, more things and she wanted him to have his own square. Yeah. Then he he was Desi and Bobby and Fred. I don't know what they were. Desi, Dino and Billy. There you go. Yeah. She wanted his own square. (laughs) Yeah. And they were all in one square. (laughs) They were all in one square. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but she was there every show. But she came, boy, uh, she was there. She was a good mama. And, uh, you know, but that was my story. With, But I can remember I, I, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's his first part. Oh, that's right. I've seen the clip. Yeah. The only yeah. Thing, first thing he he's ever a, did. He's a masseuse. He's a masseuse. Right. And he comes in. He's as big as a house. And he has one line or something. And... And Art Carney ad-libbed this. We did it in front of an audience. You know, do it live. He walks in, and he sees this guy, and, and then he leaves, and, uh, and he says goodbye to the, to Lucille Schwarzenegger does. And, 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 uh, Art just looks, he says, et te, brute. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's one story in the book. Now, I know you wrote the book over 13 years ago, Peter, yeah. but I'm going to jog your memory on this okay. one. Diana Doors. Do you oh, know the story I'm referring name, to? A real name? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's it. That, you know, I just did a thing with her son. Uh, we just shot a thing uh, with Alex Trebek. He's the special 
for Canada, and he uh, did a special uh, on all the game show hosts. And uh, his son is the director, and that's Diane. It is. Uh, uh, Dickie Dawson, Dickie right, Dawson's she was, son. She was Richard Dawson's yeah, wife. And and I said, "Who's your mom?" He said, uh, "Diana Doors." And and uh, there's a story that goes. I wasn't there, but the story is <laughs> her real name is Diana Fluck. <laughs> <laughs> That's her real name, <laughs> Diane Fluck. That's her real name. And a guy, is in, it was in England, and the guy was very nervous about Fluck. <laughs> and he said, "And here she is, Diane Clunt." <laughs> now I don't know if that's a true story, but it's a funny story. Whether it's true or not, in the book, it's too good. I put, I took a post-it and put it right on that story. I said Gilbert will like that one. Yeah. Hey Gilbert, you got to read the book. It's a good read. Yeah. And there's one story here that we have to shoehorn in here that Glenn Ford. When he was on the show, one of the questions had to do with silk stockings. Yeah. And and I think – do you remember what Glenn Ford said? I, I think I, – I think we told it. Did we, over the no, weekend. we were off mic then. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were you off mic, so we're going yeah. to repeat it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you repeat the, is the story, though. Well, you had said in the book that, uh, that you always tried – he was afraid of looking – he was insecure and he was afraid of looking dumb. So you I, always I, asked him questions about things he knew. You always played to his strengths. Yes, that's Songs, true. Questions about guns and the military uh, and westerns. Yeah. yeah. But at one point, you asked him uh, about a question about women's stockings. Oh, yeah. If, should they be kept in the freezer? Correct. Yeah. And he said, oh, uh, 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 go ahead. I, I forget. It. He said, how the hell should I know? Oh, 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 ask Vincent Price? Ask Cesar Romero. Oh, Cesar Romero. <laughs> <laughs> He said, how the hell should I ask Cesar Romero? Oh, God. See, Cesar Romero's name has popped up several times on this podcast. And there's another sweet man. In fact, yeah. I, you know how old he would have been today. He said to me once, he was very, he was so sad. I said, what's wrong with you? Uh, uh, he said, I'm going to be 60 today. He said, I'm 60 years old today. I said, what's wrong with that? You look great. He said, yeah, but in 10 years, I'm going to be 70. <laughs> We played a. I did a Fantasy Island where we were. I was married to uh, Jane Powell, and uh, she was having an affair with Caesar Romero. <laughs> Butch Romero. <laughs> Butch. That's what we all called him, Butch. And uh, a nicer man never lived. What a, I, I tell you, the, the old guys, they were all the, they, were the, they were the best. You know, I think we all came out of poverty, and, and we just appreciate what we had, you know. You've had a charmed run, uh, Peter. You've oh, had a wonderful, the people you've worked with. It's my 75th year doing this stuff, you know. Yeah, congratulations. Thank and the you. Book, the book is terrific. Thank you. I, I wish you could buy it. <laughs> I, I wish I could get a, a, some kind of a royalty out of it. Our, our fans <laughs> will find it. And, okay. and you're still working. I am. I've still got uh, Music of Your Life. and Oh, uh, one cute story. I just, okay. I just worked uh, uh, Cerritos, which is a beautiful uh, uh, performing Arts Center. I, I do big band concerts. I just worked with the Tex Medici Band. Tex is no longer with us, but the band is. And I did. we did very well. So my manager of, uh, she's only been with me 60-some years, Gloria Burke. We've been together forever. And she's, her birthday is next week. She's going to be 90. Anyway, she called. She said, hey, Cerritos wants you back. And they want you with the Benny Goodman Band. In March, this is like six weeks ago, I said, well, hey, that's pretty good. That's really soon. She said, no, March 2017. <laughs> I said, if I can remember my name or a lyric, I'll show up, you know. Uh, but, you, but look still, great. you look great to us. You look uh, like well, you're, you're you. in fine fettle. I am in fine fettle, and I, I still work. I still garden. I still go. I, I got the most wonderful wife in the world. I got 12 grandkids. I got seven great-grandkids. And uh, my life is just about as good as you can get. This is something I was going to say. It's like anyone listening to this show knows your voice sounds exactly the same. Yeah. We, yeah. grew, we grew up on the squares, and your voice hasn't changed at all. Uh, no, it hasn't. And I'm singing better than I've ever sung in my life. Don't ask me why. This uh, The other night when they had my birthday, they had me singing, you know, with Dion Warwick. They had me singing with Dinah and, and from uh, the Gordon Jenkins thing and then other stuff. And uh, I, I, you know, I never would watch my stuff. I would look at this sounds awful. But I said, 
that's pretty good. You know, <laughs> that's pretty good. And and I got to say, we're both looking at you now, and we, we're we not looking at a 90-year-old man. We're looking at Peter Marshall. Oh, well, you know, you. look you. the same. You look terrific. We're not blowing smoke up your yeah. skirt. Well, good. You can buy my CDs. My <laughs> CDs are for sale. Go ahead and plug them. Go ahead. I, I just did a CD that's kind of nice. It's called Let's Be Frank with a Touch of Tommy, where I recreated uh, the Pied Pipers, Joe Stafford, uh, and I, but taking all the old songs and redoing them completely, doing them uh, as they might have been done today. So uh, it's called Let's Be Frank with a Touch. Then I have a, a CD that did really well. It's still out there. It's called Boy Singer. What do you guys read it? You're reading something. Yeah, we, got a, we got a note. We got a note, and we're gonna add, we're gonna put you on the spot since we're talking about your singing. We're gonna ask you to if you could just uh, croon a couple of bars of, of something for us. Maybe from Bye Bye Birdie. Your choice. <laughs> Gray skies are going to clear up, put on a happy face, brush off the clouds and cheer up. Hey, put on a happy face. Take off that gloomy mask of tragedy. It's not your style. There you go. I love it. Wow. <laughs> he sounds great. <laughs> So well, not only is your speaking voice the same, but your singing voice. It is. It's exactly the same. I looked at the other night and I laughed. I said, my God, that was 40 years ago. Wow. Fantastic. And the last thing we're going to ask, and this is completely off the reservation. Okay. We talk about somebody on this show. He was better known by the name Crazy Guggenheim. Oh, yeah. yes. Frankie and Fontaine. You, work, we, you we, worked we, with we, Frankie Fontaine. We worked the uh, Billy Gray's band box. And so it was our first big job. Yeah, I, Polly Bergen got us the job. Polly Bergen was singing a little joint. Uh, it used to be very popular. Hackett worked it. Uh, go, everybody worked. Billy Gray's band box. What a beautiful little club. And it was a Jewish club. And we were about as goyim as you could get, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Polly said there was an opening, and she said to, to Max Gold, she said, hey, these two guys are working down on Slauson. They would be a big hit here. And we went in for one night and stayed 16 weeks. Wow. And uh, that was the beginning. And Polly, Polly got us that job. And uh, she was a country singer in those days. I bet you did, her opening song was Honky Tonkin' Honky Tonkin' I'm just... Hon-. She was a country singer. I remember <laughs> Polly Bergen. Did you know that, Gil? Oh, yeah, she, I didn't know. Yeah, she was a country I singer. Yeah. I remember her in Cape oh. Fear. Oh, uh, my with, God. Uh, she yeah. wanted a life. With, with, she was really very close to Rex Reed. I, I, I'm close to Rex. And they were like brother and sister, really. They, they, he adored her. And, uh, but uh, Frankie Fontaine came in with us. They would use... Uh, there would be like six acts. There would be uh, Robert Maxwell, who wrote Ebb Tide and Shagrilla. He played the harp. And I'd be the MC. This is a true story. This is when, when uh, Reagan became president. I was a little uh, anxious about it. Uh, I used to MC the show, and Tommy would heckle me. And I would say, now, ladies and gentlemen, and he would say, you're a damn good-looking fellow. I mean, you're damn good-looking. I said, thank you very much, sir. And I would go on, and then he'd say, <laughs> I, 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 and he would do other stuff, but he kept, you're damn good-looking. Well, he finally, uh, after about three acts, it was our turn, and I would say something about Pittsburgh. I knew a bass player. He said, I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh. And he got up, and he walked up on stage, and the guy sitting in the front grabbed him. And said, young man, I've taken just about enough of this I can take. This man has been working hard all night. And you and it was Ronald Reagan. Wow. Oh went, my God. Whoa. He was the only guy that didn't know. <laughs> 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 so when he became president, I went, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. But the funny she thing is, he well, and Noonan became very close friends. Reagan and Noonan. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this is you're one of those guests that we could go another twenty hours with and not touch upon. You're also one of those guests that makes the interview easy because you do all the work. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> so well, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. With my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, at Nutmeg Post, with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> and the great Peter Marshall. Well, thank you, guys. Peter, it's well, been a you. treat. Give us your plugs one more time. The radio show. Radio show, music of your life. Just I'm on uh, two hours in the morning, and they repeat it at night. Nine on the west, so I guess it's 12 in the east. 
And uh, Boy Singer, you can get No Happy Endings, a thing called Let's Be Frank with a Touch of Tommy. You can buy them all through uh, uh, Amazon. And they're pretty good, guys. They're really. I, <laughs> We're going to get them and listen. Uh, well, if you like Dick Hames or Sinatra or Bob Eberly, that whole era, I think you'll like what I do. And once more, the book, Backstage with the Original Hollywood Square. And it comes, I must say, this is interesting, it comes with a CD. It does. It comes uh, these, with a, C- a CD of your favorite jokes from the show, your favorite zingers. You'll hear everybody ever heard on those zingers. That, that was a big – That's that record sold a fortune, but I didn't own it. That was Heda Quigley who gave me the permission to put it in the book. We barely scratched the surface of this man's career. And and as, as someone who was a later regular on Hollywood Squares – in the 2,000 years, I bow down to you, sir. Well, thank you, Gilbert. That's so sweet of you, and I love your work. I really do. Oh, thank well, you. Well, Peter, there's a clip online of Gilbert you should check out of, uh, of him on the, the most recent version of Hollywood Squares. Oh, really? Just look up Gilbert Gottfried Hollywood Squares and— You fool. You fool. Uh, yes. you, uh, Gilbert Gottfried Hollywood Squares, you fool? You fool. Yes. You'll love it. Okay. We'll do that right now. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be a good laugh for you. And thanks so much, buddy. Thank My pleasure. you, Peter Marshall. Good luck, guys. 